doesn't snore, neither do I. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's get back to serious. Right. Okay, so we, we, we got the pinky drop here, right? Okay, so let's talk about the three main ways that you can hold the bat. And actually, there's there's four, but we're going to simplify into three. Um, so we're all going to do this, and this is the this is the main way here on the bottom hand. But let's talk about the top hand. Your conventional baseball grip, okay, you know, just like so. Some people advocate lining knuckles up. I do not personally like that. Um, I like kind of in between where it's a little bit more comfortable where you can still get control if you're pushing the ball backside or your wrist will still roll over plenty good if you're pulling the ball. Um, so if I'm not telling you not to roll, line your knuckles up if you've been doing that and you're very comfortable with it and it's, it's like you're successful with that, that's fine. But a lot of people think that's the one, you know, that you've got to line your knuckles up. You don't. Okay, so if you do and you're successful with it and you're comfortable with it, don't change it. But that's a common fallacy that you've heard that, you know, from the baseball side of things, that, you know, that everybody talks about that. So if that's your, you know, your conventional baseball grip, you know, like that, you see, you know, a lot of guys doing that. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, again, this is, this is a personal thing that you find you play around with and you find what becomes comfortable to you and gives you your best results. And as I told you, I changed my grip six months ago after almost 30 years of gripping the bat the same way. Um, just messing around one day at batting practice and became comfortable and hit pretty well that way, that day and hit pretty well the next day. And then we played a tournament that weekend and hit pretty well in the tournament. I'm like, I guess I got a new grip because I really <laughs> like this. Okay, so the next grip, I'm gonna go to the extreme and then we're gonna come back. Uh, this is what people call the overlap grip where you're, you literally only have one hand, one, you know, these fingers around the bat like this and all of these fingers overlap here, okay? And you'll, you know, there's there's a pretty good amount of people that 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 use this grip. I personally think that uh, I might consider using this grip if all I had to do was get up and try to hit home runs all the time. But I don't have that luxury. Um, I have to control the ball, as all of you do as well. I I think that you lose a little bit of control like this. Again, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. Um, I'm just want to explain to you what it is and what and what it can do. It does help you roll the hands and, and, and you do get extension and a little bit extra bat speed by doing that. Um, some people think that it helps them pull the ball a little bit better because the, the snap of the, uh, the wrist when you're doing that. But that's, you know, that's a full overlap grip, like, like so. What I've kind of developed for myself, I actually used to kind of have just one little pinky down, you know, like this. Um, Recently, I've gone to a, what I call a partial overlap, where I have two fingers on the back and two fingers here. And I, I feel like it, it helped me to get extension and to get whip through the ball, but I still feel like I can control the ball when I need to go to right field or I need to, you know, I'm picking a hole, uh, you know, where I want to hit or a gap that I'm hitting. I still have plenty of control of the bat, but if I do have a situation where I can free swing, I feel like I get a little bit extra snap through the ball, and I was I was able to, I think, actually increase bat speed slightly um, with this grip, like this. So this is what I call a partial overlap grip. So the thing, the thing that bothers me about those is it feels like that when the ball hits the bat, the more solid you are connected to the bat, the farther it'll go. And if and if I'm now you know making it so it's just this little tight thing here, and I'm kind of loose. That the ball's not going to go as far. Well, actually, that's not necessarily true because I know some of the most prolific home run hitters in the young kids game in the conference. If you guys ever watch that, do a full overlap grip where they're holding the bat literally like this, okay? And and they're hitting balls 400 feet, okay? And yeah, granted they're 25, 28 years old or whatever, but there is a lot of power to be had. It's something. It's something that you would have. You have to hit and hit and hit and get used to. And again, I'm not telling you to use a full overlap grip. But in your mind, you're, you're kind of taking out, out the equation of being able to hit like that. But actually, when you get used to it, it's, it can be a very powerful thing. Yes. Now, again, you have to be able to, uh, the control part of it is the key. I like to say, like, with, you know, if you're a right-handed hitter, of course, your lead hand, you know, is generating power and the whip through the ball. This is our control hand so much more where we keep our bat on plane. And I feel like when I only have this, I don't control the head of the back quite as good, which is why I don't like a full overlap grip. But you might want to, you know, definitely if you don't already, try this, you know, with the pinky drop. 
and you know maybe you want to try one little hang overlap or two if you want to again this this is the time to experiment with it and you know play with it today play with different bats today and and today's a good day to kind of experiment some things if, if you're comfortable with what you're doing and, and you know then don't change it but we want it we want to show you some of the different ways and different things that you can do um, and because who knows maybe you make a change in your grip and it's like an epiphany and, and I, I really kind of felt that way look I don't change a whole lot with my swing um, I've been doing you know basically the same thing for a long long time but it worked you know and I've, I've known about these things I just never really tried it and when I did it really worked so Alan, may I add that? Yeah, absolutely. if you're if you're a hitter that uses all fields and like to go backside depending where the pitch is I think the best grip control wise is this in here you do lose a little bit on this if you're just going to hit the ball for, you know, bat speed and just try to overpower the defense, that'll work. But if you're going to try to control the ball in terms of going middle, backside. Agreed. The more the, the more you have on the bat, you probably have a little bit more control. That does do a lot of control. And, and again, you, you do have to have some grip strength and some forearm strength. The more that you overlap, the more of that you're going to have to have to keep the control on the bat. Okay? Um, I feel really total under control like this okay but you might try it and your bat head as you're coming through is dropping slightly next thing you know you're hitting fly ball fly ball fly ball fly ball again don't abandon it right away but look if it's not going to fit you and your style of te and technique and your strength ability or whatever then go to where it's comfortable there's not a right or wrong here there really isn't it's it's something that you just want to get where you're comfortable with because when you get in the batter's box you don't want to be thinking about grip. You don't want to be thinking about anything. Like Bob said, what, 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 what's the quote from yesterday, Bob? You can't think and hit at the same time. And you can't. <laughs> Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra, you can't think and it's hit at the same acronym. time. It's an acronym. I'm sure if somebody's heard it, it's called KISS. <laughs> Keep it, it simple, simple, stupid. Yeah. We, we talked about that before you got here yesterday because you were late. Yeah. boom. Yeah. So anyway, no, we no, we did. My son might have been a little upset if I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's a good question. Yes, sir. You play around with different grips and BP and all of that over the course of a weekend. Do you find yourself just using one grip or just sometimes oh, I, a situation? I, a situation won't dictate something like you know what I got to press for that base hit. I'm, I'm going to go to something that the I know. The only time that I I do occasionally do that, and and this is just me, is let's say we have no home runs or nobody's on base, and I for sure do not want to take a chance of hitting a home run. Okay. Sometimes what I do is I will shorten my hand up here, and instead of having all my fingers, you know, the two fingers off. Sometimes I will change my grip to only have one finger off. Again, it's a control thing, okay? Where I've seen a hole or I've seen a gap, and we'll talk about this, usually you wanna have one or two things that you've identified before you get in the box of a possible lag in a defense or a guy cheating you or whatever that you wanna go after. Um, when I'm going after stuff like that, yeah, so to answer your question, yes, I do slightly change my grip here. As far as what I do here, I don't. I'm comfortable with this in any situation now. It's just become me, and I'm fine with it, whether I'm driving it to the right side, driving the middle, or whatever. You, when we hit today, you can watch me. I'll, I won't change, you know, and I'm as comfortable hitting the ball backside as not. But that's just, that's me. And again, I'm not trying to tell everybody to hit like I do or grip the bat like I do. I want to give you the different ways, um, some educated expectation of what you might find out if you do, you know, try this grip or try that grip. And that's why you're here. That's why you're here. Experiment, see what works for you, see what feels comfortable for you. But, you know, give whatever you're experimenting with enough time to see if it, you know, don't give, don't take five swings and say that's no, I, you know, no way. Now, if, you know, you take five swings and three times the bat flies out of your hand, yeah, I think you might want to expand. <laughs> so, yeah, we're gonna get some glue. <laughs> yeah, get some more sticky stuff. Let me add a little bit of the science to it. And Alan's mentioned, Alan says the longer the lever, the what? The more leverage. The more leverage. <laughs> Anybody understand that? Yeah. Okay. Let me give you a little visual aid on that. What what we have here, how long are these softball bats? 34. Every single one of them is 34 inches long. So when people are choking down on the bat, they're making the bat longer from the top of the hand to the end of the bat. They've increased the length of the lever. Visual. Golfers here? We got any golfers? All right. The driver is longer than the pitching wedge. 
The driver is used for what? Power. Distance. <laughs> Distance. The pitching wedge is used for control. control. All right. So the same thing with the bat. All right. If you wanna, if you wanna overload. All right, you're trying to create a driver. You're trying to create distance because the longer the lever, the greater the velocity at the end of the lever. If you want a base hit, remember Pete Rose back in the day, what'd he do? Yeah. Choked up. He choked up on the bat. He made the bat shorter so he could control it better. So he could barrel it up, all right? Just make contact, try to keep it in the yard. So the science of it, come here, let me use my guys here. Here's a visual aid here. Alan is going to start here. We're going to add, we're going to make this lever longer. Come on, Jeffrey. All right. Every time we add somebody, the lever gets longer. Now, if we start to rotate this way, all right, let's rotate. Come on. <laughs> Alan's barely moving. Well, hold on, Roger. Well, what's Jeff doing? Got to move faster. Yeah. Jeff's got to haul butt. Now, if we, added, if we added all of you guys to that lever, the longer that lever got, that last guy would be sprinting Just around in the circle. You see what that does to your barrel head? So you understand that? So the longer the lever, the greater the velocity at the end of the lever. That last guy is hauling butt. Okay? So that's why the driver is longer than the sand wedge and the whole nine yards. But that's why people, they take a 34-inch bat and they're cheating. They're making it longer. But you're going to lose a little bit of control. But when they're trying to hit it out of the ballpark, it's not all about control. It's about getting the ball in the air. And that leads to our next segment here. All right? We're going to talk about the contact area of the round object on a round object. All right, we've got a round bat and a round ball. So the contact area is pretty small. The actual surface of the ball that, that ends up hitting the bat, it's pretty small, all right? As a hitter, we're gonna actually create spin on the ball. Got that? We're gonna create spin on the ball, just like in golf. If you're early and you make contact with the barrel ahead of the hands, all right, what's gonna happen is, thank you. Here's the angle. So when that ball's coming in this way, it's now gonna hit and go that way with a little left to right spin. That's, he's simulating a pulled ball. You okay. Know, you know, going into left field for yeah. right. So if you make contact too far out in front or you let your barrel get out of the head of the hand, you're gonna create a little hook spin. All right? And that ball's gonna, most of those balls you pull down the line, sometimes they do what? They hook foul. They hook foul. All right? So if the bat head, if you're a little earlier, that bat head gets out there too much, you're gonna hook it, all right? If you're right on, if you wait a little longer, that pitch down the middle, this is called squaring it up. If you can square it up, you're gonna be a lot more successful in the game. Squaring it up means the hands and the barrel get to the ball at the same time. Notice that, my hands and barrel got to the ball at the same time. That ball's gonna go to center field. It's only gonna have either top spin, back spin, or no spin at all. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But the object of the game is to square it up. We are stronger right here. All right, now if the barrel's a little late or the pitch is away, look at the angle, and now that's going to have slice spin. It's going to spin right to left. All right? I use the example here if you ever play ping pong and you take your paddle and you slice the ball, the ball goes like this. It's exactly the same thing. Inside out. But even as a hitter, we create spin on the ball. Which one, <clears throat> let me ask you this question. Let's look at the field. Where do you have more power? Let's say we're right-handed hitters. Where do you have more power? Left field, center field, or right field? How many people think right-handed hitters have more power to left field? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people think you have more power to center field? How many people have think you have more power to right field? All right. <laughs> Sometimes that's preference, but the science. Yeah, you, just start, you can hit it anywhere, bro. Here's the science of it. It's the laws of rebound. This, this, or this. Which one's going to go farthest? This one. The one you squared up. All right. And here's the great way. Think of baseball fields. Down the line. Shorter. Let's think of Fenway. Down the line. Shorter. Shorter. Three ten. Maybe. Center field. All right. 405 maybe. Right field, Pesky's pole. 275. 275. Or Yankee Stadium, 296. Well, it goes crazy. The but, world's made for left-handed here. <laughs> but think of all baseball <laughs> fields. Yeah. Think of all baseball fields. Right. Which field?
field is the farthest. Yeah. Center, center, center field. Why? Square it up. Because if you square it up, it goes farther to center field. Let's look at this field, the softball field. What do we got down the line? 300. What do we got in center? 300. What do we got in right? 300. So if you're trying to go yard and you want to hit the ball out of the ballpark, where should you try to hit it? Right field. <laughs> center field. Center field. All right, everybody wants to pull, 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 pull. Center field. Another reason. Where's the biggest hole in the infield? Forming mm -hmm. infield. Field. Yeah. Center field. field, right through the middle. You just got to get it by that screen right there. And let me tell you, he's preaching because that's where he hits all the time. <laughs> that's where he lives. Four man outfield. There's a gap in center field. Sometimes you get up to the plate and you can see all the way to the fence in center field. All right? So don't get pull happy. Try to square the ball up, hit it right back where it came from. And we're, we're talking center field too. We don't necessarily mean dead over second base. We're, you know, you're talking, you know, 10, 15 feet here, 10, 15 feet there. You got that alley of center field. You know, this also helps you by by staying closed up. A lot of us fly open, shoulders come open, hips open up real early. Feet move in the box. By hitting between left center, Where's right center, they'll help you stay closed up. Right and a lot more bat speed. Your bat speed, the highest point is right there. Yeah. It starts decreasing after it. Does All right. your answer change? Be playing against one of these crappy 65 teams, and they put their extra fielder right behind right. second they base. They want you to change yeah. the swing. Well, of course. That's yeah. 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 Now, now, now look, what we're, talking, when we're talking about power, too. You have to realize what your power game is and what your limitations are as a hitter. What are you best at? Are you a power hitter that can hit balls over people's heads? Are you a power hitter that can hit balls over the fence? And, and if, th if that's not part of your game, then obviously this really isn't necessarily directed specifically for you. However, what you brought up with is the defense part of the game, absolutely, and, and we're gonna, actually we're gonna get into that even, even more so here. So yeah, you wanna look at your defense and Bob, Bob is probably, I, I think, the best hitter in softball at picking two spots and hitting one of them every single time. He hits over 800 pretty much every weekend. And he does it like that. And he can do it without hitting a home run. But when the time comes to hit a home run, he'll hit it as far as anybody. So, well, look at him. <laughs> I told Bob, I said, it wouldn't be fair if God made me his It just wouldn't be fair. I just moved everything up a little bit. <laughs> no pressure, Bob. What happens then is when they, when they, when they take that hole away, <laughs> when they add that fifth man in the infield, they've opened up something else. Yes. And now they've opened up the gaps. But you still, you got left center and right center. It's still the middle of the field. Now, now I, I know some, keep it away some of you guys in the center. 60s play with an extra fielder all the time, right? right. Five man infield right. plus four man outfield, yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. right? So that also, you know, you got to look at that and, and take that into account too and what you're going to try to do. The good news is they're crappy. over 60 and they don't run balls down as well <laughs> as, right. as they did earlier. And the last that, part about true. ball travel and distance is where do we make contact on the ball? Okay. If we hit the ball, if we're a little early, and we hit the ball below center, way below center, where's this ball going to go up? Uh -huh. It's going to go up. Backspin, and it's going to go straight up. If we get a little bit higher on it, this is going to be backspin more of a, that's probably the home run spot right there, believe it or not. All right? You get a little bit closer to center, now you've got a line drive, okay? You get square, right? Dead center That's in the middle. Ball. That's the biggest compliment ever. Yeah. You hit the ball biggest square compliment. on the square part of the bat. You hit it square right in the center of the ball. You hit the center of gravity and it came off with no spin on it. It knuckled, okay? Hard to catch. It's not gonna travel as far, all right? But it's tough to catch. You know, the infielders and the outfielders, they got a battle hitting on Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Slightly above center. Now you've got maybe a one hopper. A little bit more above that. Now you got a four hopper, and then if you hit the top of the ball, it's a bunt. Go Swing back to the bunt. Dugout. That's where you're going. <laughs> so when to first you know what you're trying to do, if you're trying to get it, if there's a five-man infield, you want to elevate it. You got to get it in the air. So you want to be a little early, or you want to make contact on the lower half of the ball and get it in the air. Okay. If it's a four-man and the five-six hole is wide open and you just, nobody's on base, and, and you just want to get a base hit and drive it through that hole, get you an inside pitch that you can turn on, 
and hit the, somewhere above the center of the ball and go ahead and hit you a ground ball. But we do have control of what the ball does off of our bat. All right? But it's all about the spin that we put on the ball. Okay? Everybody understand that? If you see side spin on the ball, what did you do? Well, some. Or you just drug the bat through. What if you pulled it and had and it had left to right spin? Then you really inside outed. You dragged the barrel a little bit, all right, and you pulled across the ball at contact. You weren't going to the ball. You were actually coming across the ball at contact and created some side spin on it. So. Watch the spin. After you hit it, watch the spin, and that'll tell you a whole lot. Was I early? Was I late? Was I on time? Okay. And what was I trying to do with that swing? For all you Yankee fans, Derek Jeter was a specialist. Absolutely. The best, the best hitter I think that I've ever seen at being able to take inside pitches and hit them to right field effectively over and over and over again. Um, that's something almost you know, it's hard to even coach that. You don't that. even try to teach I don't try to teach that very well because it, he was just very gifted at that. Yeah. Very gifted at that. Okay, switch to lunch. Uh, Real quick, though, I just want to get back to the knob and no knob, right? Oh, yeah. Alan, when I first started playing with him, this is how I used to swing, right? And, and I went to a knob, and I'll tell you why I felt like where he says, make a change, you might be surprised. I would go, uh, with this one, I would get a lot of blisters hitting. Plus, I feel like I had to grip the bat a lot harder to keep it from coming out of my hand. When I put this knob on here, and this is, again, personal preference, when I put this knob on here, it, my wrists are different, the grip is a lot smoother, I don't have to squeeze the bat, and I have not gotten the blister with this yet. So, but that's, again, it's personal preference. Like, I am a, I don't drop a finger off, I put a finger on the, on the knob, and then I put a finger on my ear. Right, but with this thing, it doesn't allow me. I don't have to like squeeze the knob so hard because now my finger's laying on it. So just when it comes back to grip, don't like where he's saying is change your grip. This is a great time to practice changing your grips because you'd be surprised on things that you thought you were the the. Well, I call my when I work with my girls, I, I do batting lessons and for boys and girls, whatever. I tell them, you guys don't know unless you change. You've been taught by the book how to hold the bat. There's no by the book, it's whatever you guys prefer, right? I generally, and he does lessons too, I do lessons. I don't have, you do it my way or it's the highway. I adjust girls, like I showed him a girl yesterday, but that girl, I show you with that leg lift. Some girls in softball, they don't have time. I, I've got a girl that does this and she's great at it. And I got girls who do that and they're not great at it. So where he's saying to make, try to make adjustments here today or during these camps, You'd be stunned on the things that will happen when you try to change something here and there. And if it doesn't work, go back to what you know. A lot of times, right? the little things, the little, little changes things. you make that make the huge results. Little Carlton. things. You'll watch when we take swings. He doesn't leg lift. I leg lift. It's just something I've done my whole baseball, <laughs> softball <laughs> career. Right? Yeah, circle. So it, again, circle. Again, that comes down to personal <laughs> preference. Right? Talk about your grip. Yeah. Bottom hand tight, top hand loose. Uh, Bob's going to yeah. speak specifically yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, he's going to. Yeah, gonna, and that, he'll probably cover what, what you just asked. Yeah, exactly. But, but I'm just saying, don't be afraid to try some different stuff. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know the knob is super light. Doesn't it affect your end load? Not at all. Well, I mean, to me, it doesn't. In your in your head, yes. <laughs> um, and we're going to. I'm going to talk about end load versus balance bat. So we're going to segue into that in a second. So let let me handle that there. Okay. okay. Yeah. Doesn't yes, affect me at all. You spoke yeah. about end result of spin. What about intentional spin? What? Well, we spoke about end result. We spoke about, okay, you know, you hit the ball this way. If you hit the ball that way, it's kind of fate. But what about intentional spin? You're up in the box, and you're thinking in terms of putting spin on a ball. You're not supposed to be thinking in the box, Scott. <laughs> all right. What are the <laughs> dynamics of that? It's the same thing. If you're trying to throw it into the right center gap, you want to inside out the ball. We just talked about Derek Jeter yeah. did it. Really and what bad. that means They're is you can bad. take a pitch, instead of squaring it up, you can let it get a little deeper. You can lead with the hands and intentionally create this spin. You can intentionally do what you were doing unintentionally yesterday. <laughs> 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 uh, for those of you that were here, Brad was hitting yesterday. Yeah. And every single oh. ball that he hit, he probably hit eight out of ten out of the park and he did the exact same thing and he just spun the ball it went high and dropped wherever it dropped 
And, you know, that's something I'd like to that's well, understand that's instead right. of just, you know, yeah. wow, what happened this time? Exactly we right. talked about the home run derby oh, where we, we talked about the uppercut versus the level cut versus slightly down. That that has a direct effect on, on you trying to spin the ball, all right? If you're trying to create backspin, we want to go level or down into it just a little bit, and you want to hit below the center of the ball, and that's just called spinning it. And that's yeah. what we want to do in home runs. We want to spin the ball. We want to get backspin. We all know backspin's going to travel right. farther. So I use the analogy right? with the girls when I work with my girls, because I get girls that come from other hitting coaches that are teaching them to drop the barrel, swing up, like Aaron Judge, right? I always say to them, because they throw, I'm going to use a guy's analogy, but girls are different. If a girl throws a rise ball, she puts backspin on it and it goes up. Well, if a, a baseball player throws a curveball, he puts topspin on it and it goes down. So I'm trying to create that rise ball off my bat. Because if you square a ball up, it's going to knuckle, it's not going to go anywhere. But if I put backspin on a ball, what's that going to create? Lift. And I'm trying to create lift. Floating a ball out of the park is better than trying to mash it out of the park. Because the ball will carry farther if you spin it. You hit the top of the ball, it's going to create top spin, and that's where you get those humpers that go over the infield. This is kind of uh, So I don't swing up. Right. I swing flat and you'll, I cut through. You'll, you'll see the, the slightly different nah, thing when you... I, well, fast pitch, no, you don't want no, to. No, not, no. Slow pitch, we can't. No. So yeah, you, you have a lot You have a lot more ability to change this, things right. in swing planes yeah, and slow pitch and in fast pitch. But the idea is, and this is kind of an advanced skill that you build, you know, that you work on. But you want to be a good hitter first before you worry about being a home run hitter. And you got to learn the mechanics of being a good hitter and get yourself comfortable with that. And I'm not talking, I'm not saying, I'm not just you out. But what, a, but what I'm at is you, you should be able to, at, at a certain point, hopefully build enough confidence and skill if you're trying to do that of literally flattening your swing out, driving a ball in a, in a hole, okay, because you want to keep it in the park. Or like Brad said, it's not, and it's not drop the barrel head. The only time you ever see someone drop the barrel head that really will hit a home run is someone that's hitting a shorter pitch that they may or may not should have swung at to begin with. But really, <coughs> the consistent home run hitter or the consistent person that drives the ball, maybe not even a home run hitter, a, a gap hitter or a guy that's gonna burn somebody, is someone that just slightly elevates the bat through the swing. Because remember, we just wanna cut just below the center of that ball to get that backspin. So it's not this, it's this. And I it's always, only it's only so about that much. Just think about it, you're setting your bat on a table and you're running it across the top of your dinner table. That's mm -hmm. kind of what you're trying to do. Okay, instead of taking the legs out and coming up through the, you know. <laughs> I don't want to remember that. the last derby. <laughs> you were pitching to me and I just couldn't, I'm, Dropping bombs to the fence, and he, and he turns around after we're done. Hey, you're better than thousands, Scott. Yeah, with one home run. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, a <laughs> I did the same thing. I just when we couldn't adjust, the, uh, you know, and I just didn't know how to. Last year, I just, you know, I was, you know, when you get home run derby, sometimes you get, you know, you want to hit it far, and it's a big field, and you know, I was over swinging a little bit, but I just hit line drive after line drive after line drive, and I, I think I even told. Bob or somebody, I, said, yeah, I just hit 940. The problem <laughs> is, and here's the thing, he can throw cookie after cookie for the most, and just uh, every time we pitch to him, I think we all get nervous and we can't throw him a damn strike the same time. <laughs> I, 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 I know. I, you got to see the adjustment. Yeah. But anyway, but as good as he is, he should be able to hit bad pitches. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> well, no, and we're going to talk about that right now. Thank that's a great, great segue, segue. Into, yeah. into what we're going to talk about, which is pitch selection. Okay. Let me and start with this story uh, real quick and lead into you. One of the greatest hitters of our generation is a guy by the name of Tony Gwynn. Somebody asked him one day, what is your secret? And usually major leaguers don't want to give their secret away, but he says, my secret was I hit good pitches. So in other words, he hit strikes. All right? And now we're going to talk about why what, that's what, so important. I have a little something to add to that. Um, something kind of psychological and interesting. They were uh, interviewing David Ortiz. And uh, they were asking him, how is it that you're always able to hit in clutch situations? How do you do it? What is your mentality? How, what's your technique? How do you do it? And he said, I'm not afraid to fail. Yep. And that's very interesting because we all have a little thing in us that we want to do good. Of course. To the point where we're a little afraid to fail. <laughs> but if you erase the afraid to fail part, you don't have to worry about it. I'm going to erase my video from yesterday then. <laughs> 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 
put them both. After we do pitch selection, I'm going to address <laughs> that exact issue. Okay. I played ball with Dante Bichette a little bit, and he, I, he, I told, he told me, and he goes, what makes a good hitter a great hitter? Pitch selection. selection. So that's what we're going to talk about for a minute. He was a great good hitter. You, you, heard, you heard me yesterday, a lot of you saying, hit strikes, hit strikes, hit strikes, right? Let's get back to the same thing. It's ratios, it's numbers, it's averages, it's on base percent. That's what we're all after. Excuse me. And if you don't hit strikes, you can go from a 750 hitter to a 500 hitter really fast. Because look, the law of averages says that if that ball is not coming in and going to hit that plate and you swing at it, you're not going to be able to hit it as well as if it was going to hit the plate. It's simple as that. I mean, you hear people say, well, I'm a bad ball hitter. Well, then you aren't a good hitter. Because I'm going to tell you right now, guys that consistently hit bad pitches are not good hitters. You, they're not. Or they're not as good as they could be. Bob came up with a, a great comment. We always put, in fact, it's written on the sheet. Every pitch is hittable. In softball. In softball, right? I mean, Slow pitch softball. other than, you know, a <laughs> guy that bounces one by 10 feet in front of the plate, he can't reach or whatever. But when every pitch is hittable, like how many of them do you really want to swing at? You don't want to swing at every pitch. You want to be swinging at strikes. You also want to start to identify what your strengths and weaknesses are as a hitter. Some people, you know, the taller people generally hit balls a little bit higher, better than us little guys, okay? The, the dude's six foot 12 over there. I mean, he can hit balls that it would be over my head and he, would, he, thinks, it's, he thinks it's just right, right in his power zone. He's, he's killing it, okay? <clears throat> you have to know a little bit about yourself as a hitter to know what you're looking for as far as a pitch goes. And don't be afraid on the first pitch if somebody gives it to you to swing at it, okay? Yesterday, mental approach. I put a one-to-one -one count on you. What does that make you do in the batter's box? You've got to get in there and get ready. The first good pitch you see in a one-to-one -one situation, you hit it, okay? You don't take a strike. And it, there's nothing wrong with even if you have a full count. If that guy throws you that, your favorite pitch, hit it. Don't be up there saying, I'm going to take a strike first. No, sir. What do you change in a one pitch tournament? I'm sorry? What do you change or do you change in a one pitch? As far as what I do yeah. in the batter's box? Right. Swing the bat. I swing the bat. I do the same thing that I've talked to you guys about that we've talked about all the time is I call timeout, I do my landscaping, I've watched what the pitcher's tendencies are, and you know, you might not identify it perfectly. You know, the guy might mess up and throw a short pitch when he's been throwing nothing but deep. Okay, we don't want to... Um, uh, I think it was Rico. We were talking out the gate where we were trying to break into the park. Um, and I told, you know, small adjustments in the batter's box, three inches here, three inches there, which is going to get me to the next part of this, are big. You don't have to make giant steps. <coughs> let, let me, in fact, let's go to the batter's box if you guys want to get a little closer. I'm going to show what we're talking about. And, and I'm going to break into the second part of hitting strikes. And <coughs> get on that side, gang. It's a little easier to see okay. right here. <laughs> this is what I like to do, and this, this photo ball. touches on a little bit about what Video we did ball. yesterday. You guys all know what this box is now, right? Because you learned yesterday. And you guys are all impact zone hitters now. So what I've done here is I've made a quadrant. So I, what I do, what I call this is quadrant hitting. Okay. I'm gonna typically get in the batter's box if I don't, you know, regular pitcher. I don't see any big, you know. Sometimes he's deep, sometimes he's not. Whatever. This is my typical stance somewhere like this, okay? Now, your question was, great question, what do you do you know, when, in a one-pitch situation? Or let, let's take that even a step further. As Bob has taught me, I used to be pick a spot. If it wasn't a home run situation, I would usually pick one spot and go for it, okay? And what I would do in the batter's box is something I still want to teach you all, but now, Bob has expanded my horizons to where I actually have two spots, okay? I, I've got a secondary spot. Because sometimes if that spot is over there, I might not get the pitch, even though it's a strike, to go over there. And that's what's called forcing pitches, okay? So it, it's a strike, but it's here. Now, I can hit that, I can hit that pitch over there, okay? I can dare jeter it, but when I do that, you know, I probably am a 650 hitter instead of a 750 hitter, okay? It's not acceptable to me, okay? So that's forcing a pitch. So here, here's what 
what I like to do in the batter's box. So we all have our 80% go-to favorite place in the batter's box, which you, you should you know find for yourself, okay? Now, I've done my homework. I've watched the pitcher like I'm supposed to. I've looked at the defense how I'm supposed to. And I've identified that not only do I have, a, I, I've hit three balls over to the left side of the field, and I hit a home run, and I hit a couple base hits, and I popped up to the pitcher. But no. Anyway, I've hit three balls this side of the field. And so the defense now, when we typically play, when most major plus teams play five man infield, three outfielders. Okay? So you don't, if you've got three guys on this side, or maybe this guy's a little bit on this side, of, and typically they'll, they'll usually play me a little bit on this side of the, of the bag um, in, in a you know, base hit situation or whatever. So I noticed the second baseman's a little lazy and he's like there. And the first baseman's there, and see what I've identified is if I hit that ball on the ground, on a line drive, or even on a line, uh, a, a fly ball, if I can hit that light pole, I'm gold. That's my direction, okay? So that's my, that's my one spot. And then I've also noticed that the center fielder is playing. Over here, I still have this gap, but I also have this gap here because the left fielder is playing me to pull because I pulled balls before. So that's my secondary, okay? But my primary is I want to keep the ball in the park, okay? And, and I've identified that side of the field is what I want to do. Now, here's my, my go-to stance, right? And I'm going to hit the ball where it's pitched because I taught myself that, and I know that I'm most successful if I do that. But if I'm going to hit the ball where it's pitched, remember how we yesterday, how we set the balls and we did the, the inside, the, the center, and then the, the, uh, the outside pitch of where we're supposed to impact them, right? If I'm going to hit the pitch correctly, I really need a pitch somewhere from here out to go over there to really have good back control, have good technique, and give myself my best opportunity of doing it. What can I do to affect that to help me have even more success with that? It's a simple movement. If I stand like this, I've moved back three inches, not a foot. This is telegraphing what you're doing. Everybody knows if, if, if you normally are like this and you get in the box like this, they're going to know it's there or there. That's what you're trying to do. Okay? You don't need to do that. But three inches here, now I've bought three inches from here to here. Do you understand? Because before, these three inches really technically couldn't go over there effectively. But with three inches here, I've moved the center of this plate from here all the way over here. Now, roughly three quarters of the plate I own to do what I want with. Do you understand what I'm getting out here? Yes. Okay. Consequently, same thing. I got a hole there. I can move up slightly. Okay. Now, the more I move up, the farther out here I got to go, right? But there's a hole right between short and third because I've hit a couple balls up the middle and that garage door is wide open. So I have now bought three inches over here that I can have effective, good quality swings at a strike but be able to push a ball there. Make sense? That gets into also of the slight adjustment of here, if you the tendency of, of a short pitch, or here. Okay. We don't want to make too much of a big adjustment because look, just because he threw you two, two short pitches in a row and you move all the way up like this, the next day he drops one on the back edge and you're like, oh boy, <laughs> what am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I think it was Rico I was talking about. Chopping yeah, Look, that can happen if he gets one of those high pitches. Let me just tell you, I'm going to simplify this real quickly. Don't ever try to pull this pitch. I'm telling you, you're going to pop it up eight out of ten times. You want to wake. Unless you have Scotty's forearms. Yeah, unless, yeah. You know, if you're Scott, you'll hit it over the lights. Over there. <laughs> but what you want to do is get that ball middle to, middle to backside. You have a much better chance of getting the line drive. You'll get that little side spin on it. Get your hands out in front. Keep that barrel back a little bit, and you'll get that ball going over there. Okay? So. <laughs> Nothing. Was that, you demonstrating him. him was demonstrating right. Scotty. So, <laughs> does everybody understand that? This, this is a, a mental thing that also will help you physically in, in executing what, what it is you're trying to do. Okay, any questions? All right, last point, then we're gonna get it going here, all right? And uh, 
this is about the clutch hitter and who was it you said that was Ortiz? Big Poppy. Well, Big Poppy, you know, he gets in the box. Big Poppy's a fun-loving guy from what we can tell, right? Like and you can tell he enjoys the game. Uh, some of the hitting success or lack thereof is created by us and the brain. The brain is a very powerful thing, all right? And if you're thinking too much and you're trying too hard, we all want to win. We all want to bat a thousand every weekend, all right? The harder you try, the worse we get, all right? Story about Barry Bonds and Bobby Bonds. Everybody knows who that is, right? Barry Bonds once played for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he wasn't very good in the playoffs. In fact, he stunk. And I was a Pirates fan. All right, he struggled in the playoffs. He also struggled in the All-Star game. All right, the biggest crowd, the biggest situation, Barry Bonds wasn't so good. So one All-Star game, he uh, he asked his dad. He said, Dad, you know, why am I struggling? You know, in the big situation. And Barry said. And Bobby said, listen, son, he says, from the 25th row where you got me seats for, when you were up to bat, I could see every muscle in your forearm. And he says, yeah, Dad, I've been working out. You know, I'm hitting the weights pretty hard, and it's good. He says, no, son, that's not good. And I fell down on a needle last night, too. He says, when you get in the batter's box, <laughs> he says, when you get in the batter's box, you have to relax. All right, you have to relax, and you have to relax the muscles. All right, if you got a death grip on the bat, if you're squeezing the bat real hard, guys, this is key. If you're squeezing the bat real hard, look at the muscles in your forearm. Everybody, do that. Go ahead and pretend you're holding the bat and squeeze. All right, the juice out of it. Now, every muscle in your forearm now is contracted. How about your bicep and your tricep? Is it contracted? Yep. I'm sure it is. Okay. So now, in the big situation. The harder we try, the more, the batter we want it, all right? The more we want it, we get up there and we just squeeze the life out of the bat. What really happens, why is that bad? All right, let me tell you why, all right? We're gonna use the bicep and the tricep for an example, all right? As we swing a bat, we're gonna go from, the left arm's gonna go from flexion to extension, all right? What muscle is responsible for that? The tricep. All right, that's called the agonist. That's the muscle that's supposed to be working. We have a muscle that's just the opposite of the tricep. What is it? Bicep. It's called the bicep. It's responsible for flexion of the arm. Triceps responsible for extension of the arm. All right, they work against each other. So what has to happen when you're up to bat, if you're ready to go and you want to hit it as far as you can, you've got to let the tricep do the work. You've got to get to that extension all right, and get some good bat speed out of it. So the tricep has to be working. The antagonist, the opposite muscle, the bicep, must be what? Relaxed. Relaxed. If it's not, they start working against each other. Triceps trying to extend, the biceps holding it back. All right, so what happens to your swing then? Speed changes. It becomes slower because they're fighting against each other. Okay? You gotta let the agonist work, let the antagonist rest. You understand that? Yeah. So the harder we try, the worse off we get. Watching a free throw. When a guy misses a free throw with the game on the line, do they usually miss short or long? Short. They usually miss short. All right? It's the choking concept. We choke because we try so hard, and we try so hard. Just think of that free throw. Here we go, we got it. We go from flexion to extension, right? When they shoot a basketball. So now the tricep's supposed to work, but the bicep has to be relaxed. If the bicep is fighting the tricep, it becomes a slower action. If it's slower, it doesn't get there. Watch, you'll see, basketball on the free throw line, they'll miss short when the game's on the line. All right, so you understand that? So to have a nice smooth ballistic swing, you've gotta get in there and you gotta relax. So we talk about playing the flute, all right? We talk about relaxing the hands when you're up there. Some of the people just kind of give, they, they create just a little bit of movement. But what you've got to do is you got to relax the hands and the muscles. Now, you still got to hold the bat. Yes, we've got to have a good grip, but you don't want to swing and squeeze the life out of it. Okay, do you understand that? The other thing you can do is Happy Gilmore. You've all seen the movie? <laughs> yeah. All right, the happy place, you know? Again, the brain is a very powerful thing. You've got to, in a big situation, you got to get in there and take a deep breath, you gotta relax. 
you can't read tomorrow's newspaper today. So don't get in there and think about you being the hero, I'm going to win the game here, all right, and put all that pressure on yourself. You've got to go to your happy place. And quick story, uh, when I was coaching a couple years ago, there was a kid from Valencia in, a, in Orlando he used to have a baseball program. They had a kid that would he'd get in the box, he'd grab a handful of dirt, and he'd put it down the back of his shirt. All right? He got in there and ripped a double against us. Next at bat, all right? he gets up to bat, he grabs a handful of dirt, puts it down his back. All right? He gets in there, singles to left field. Third at bat, he doubled again. Fourth at bat, he made a homer against us. Anyway, the kid had a great day. All right? And we're sitting there watching this guy. And so the game's over, we shake hands, and uh, we coaches get together a little at the end, you know, hey, great game, blah, blah, blah. So coach, this Lightfoot guy, what's his deal? Every time he got up into the box, he took a handful of dirt and threw it down his back. I said, what's going on there? He says, oh, Lord, coach. He says, he's been going to see a sports psychologist. The sports psychologist told him to help him relax, he needs to go to his happy place. He said, what's Beach. the dirt all about? He says, the dirt, <laughs> his favorite place is heaven. Sorry, ladies. His favorite place is having sex on the beach with his girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> so the, dirt, the dirt on his back reminds him of having sex on the beach. <laughs> so he gets in the batter's box and he goes to that happy place. But what's that happy place do to you? Relax. It relaxes you. It, the oh. adrenaline slows down. Adrenaline is a great thing for a fight. It's not a real good thing when you step into the batter's box. Okay because you just try too hard, your emotions are up, your energy's up, all right, your blood's flowing. So you gotta get, especially the bigger the situation, the more relaxed you gotta be, all right? And Big Poppy's kind of a relaxed guy. And, and that's why he's a clutch hitter. And all of us should be that way, but think about that. Now the happy spot, you could put, you could put a dot on your batting glove. Some people put sayings on their hat, you know, from the Bible or, or just whatever it is. But when you find yourself in a big situation, go to your happy place. Find something that relaxes you a little bit, all right? And uh, get in there, relax, and do your job. Okay, everybody understand that? Makes sense? You guys bring a shovel? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to hit a little bit. All right, so when, when we hit, what were the, remember the four <laughs> things yesterday that we talked about that were critical in hitting? The four con the contact points, and we, we talked how the shoulders really weren't so important, but our Feet, feet, hips, 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 h